section, and we talked about the male reproductive structures. And so we almost finished, right? But I wanted to point out that one structure that we didn't talk about was the urethra. So the urethra is also part of the urinary system, and the urethra functions to transport not only urine from the bladder to the outside of the body, but also functions to transport the ejaculate. So you can write under male reproductive structures, the urethra. So this is a common um, duct for the transport of sperm and all the things that are added to the sperm via the seminal vesicles in the prostate gland and the urine. Excuse me, urine and sperm. Okay. So if I was to have this diagram on the final exam and I pointed to this structure right here, this would be the urethra. And the urethra travels through this um, spongy erectile tissue. So one of the things that's different about humans is, is that they do not have the bones in the penis. Lots of other animals do. In fact, the vast majority of like mammals do have a bone, and it is sometimes referred to as a baculum. So a baculum is a bone in the penis of most animals, of most mammals. Okay, it's not in humans. So for example, whales have baculums, dogs have baculums, beavers have baculums, right? And it's kind of interesting because one of the ways that they sometimes identify individual species of rodents, for example, is by looking at the structure of the vacuum. Okay, so um, that is not present in humans. And so we simply rely upon the erectile tissue to fill with blood in order for the erection to be um, produced. Okay. So we're gonna then talk about the female reproductive system. Okay, and so in males and females, we have gonads. And the uh, gonads become the ovaries in the females. But one of the really interesting things about the female reproductive system is, is that the ovaries are not connected directly to the ducts. And this is because when during embryonic development occurs, we actually can become either male or female early on. And there's two sets of ducts. And so if you become a female, one duct um, develops and the other duct goes away and vice versa if, if you become a male. And so the one that allows you to become a female is a little bit further away from the one that will become the vas deferens in the male, or excuse me, in the female. So we have the um, oviduct, and this is sometimes referred to as the fallopian tubes. Right? And these are actually different embryologically than the vas deferens and they do not directly connect to the ovaries. So after we're through with this lecture, we're gonna watch a video that's gonna show how when the, um, when the egg is released from the ovaries during ovulation, it actually has to be sucked up into the oviduct. And sometimes the eggs do not get sucked up properly, and then they kind of can float around in the body cavity and just kind of be lost in, inside the body cavity. So this means that the there has to be um, a suction, and it's actually produced by cilia. So cilia create a current that draws the ovulated egg into the oviduct. Okay. Now, the oviducts are also where, in order for normal embryonic development to take place, this has to be where um, the fertilization of the egg has to occur. So this is where 
the fertilization of the egg by the sperm must occur. And we'll also see that. But um, when we look at the timing, the egg cannot survive um, long enough to actually get to the uterus, which is what sometimes we refer to as the womb. And so fertilization has to take place, and then the egg can start to develop into an embryo, and then subsequently plant in the uterus, okay? So this is where it must implant, um, not implant, excuse me, but be fertilized. And so then we have another structure, which is called the uterus. So this is also referred to as the womb, and this is where implantation should occur. Okay. So sometimes there's a mistake, right? So fertilization can occur in the fallopian tubes and you can kind of sometimes get, or you sometimes do get, implantation occurring in the oviduct. And does anybody know what that is called? When implantation of the embryo occurs in the oviduct rather than in the uterus. Nobody knows. It can be very dangerous and it can actually lead to the death of the female, of the, of the mother. And so this is called a tubal or sometimes it's referred to as an ectopic pregnancy. And so that's where it's... Um, um, tubal refers to the fallopian tubes, right? And so if this occurs, oftentimes they'll have to, the doctor will actually have to go in there and surgically remove it. And sometimes it causes scarring. And sometimes that person who has that done will have one of the tubes lost. So they'll tie off that tube and then she will only be able to use the other tube. Ectopic means that outside of the uterus. So implantation occurs outside the uterus. And weirdly enough, it can actually also occur in the body cavity. So if after fertilization, the embryo goes the wrong direction, it can actually get out into the body cavity and implant, right? And so that's much, much more rare than a tubal pregnancy, okay? And so sometimes that implanted embryonic tissue can cause problems. And we'll talk about, this is a little bit different than um, endometriosis, which um, is another problem that females have because of the... Okay, so we also have a structure called the cervix. And the cervix separates the vagina from the uterus. And so this is actually a barrier. And one of the really interesting things is, is that the cervix actually is a barrier to sperm unless ovulation is occurring. So if ovulation is occurring, then the mucus that covers the cervix normally will actually get thin, and then the sperm can actually sneak through the cervix. The cervix, the cervix is not only just a barrier for the baby not coming out, but also it's a barrier for sperm to get up unless the female is ready to get pregnant. And so you sometimes hear about dilation during labor, right? And so this is the cervix. So the cervix has to thin and then it has to get wider and this is the beginning of the birth canal. So the baby comes out through the cervix, okay? Then we have um, the vagina, which receives the penis during copulation. And we're gonna talk more about that. Um, when, we, when we talk about the conditions that the sperm have to kind of overcome in order to survive um, and possibly fertilize the egg. Okay, so in your handout, I gave you a handout. Hopefully you have that handout. Okay, that's with the reproductive structures. Okay, so if I point it here, this is the ovary. Okay, notice that there's these finger-like projections and that's where the cilia are. And so they suck the um, ovulated egg up into the oviduct. This is the uterus. 
right? And what kind of muscle do you think is makes up the wall of the uterus? Smooth, smooth muscle, right? And so smooth muscle during labor, smooth muscle is contractions are initiated due to the, to the presence of oxytocin, and those contractions will actually force the baby out of the womb. Okay, so this is the uterus, and this is has smooth muscle. Now, lining the uterus is what is called the endometrium. So that's the lining of the uterus. Okay. And so we're gonna talk about, when we talk about the reproductive cycle of a female, we'll talk about the endometrium getting thicker at certain points and then sloughing off during menstruation, for example, at another point in the reproductive cycle. Okay. So this is a, um, here, this is my cervix. This is the vagina. And I want to point out here that the urethra has a separate opening. So in female, human females and in mam mammals, the, um, the, there is not a common opening to the urinary and the reproductive system. So we have a separate opening right here where urine comes out. So what do you think this structure right here is? That's the bladder. Okay. And then this would be the anus. And so that's the digestive way. So we have three openings right here in the female. We also have a vestibule gland, and this is looks to be like what in the male. So if you look at the male's uh, structure, what do you think that is? Which gland do you think that is? Nope, the bulbal urethral gland, right? And so those are actually the same embryonically. And so this just functions to lubricate the, um, the opening to the vagina during um, intercourse. Okay, so that's the same kind of homologous to the, um, to the bulbal urethral gland. And then right here we have, this is the clitoris. And in mammals where there is a baculum, so if there's a bone in the penis in a particular species, there's also a bone in the clitoris. Um, it's kind of interesting, so the, they call it an osclitoris, uh, a bony structure in the clitoris. And this is where we have erectile tissue. Now, interestingly, in our diagrams when we show the clitoris, it looks tiny compared to the male's erectile tissue because they do not show you the internal part of the erectile tissue. So, yeah, there's a kind of a push to uh, redraw these diagrams so they could actually see the extent of the erectile tissues in females. And so I have to go, oops, that's it. So if we look at the female versus the male, right? This is the clitoris, but inside and even surrounding the urethra is erectile tissue. So the clitoris is only just a small part of the erectile tissue in females. And so here they're just comparing, say for example, the different parts of the erectile tissue. This is pink, right? And so this would be similar to the shaft of the penis. And so then this is um, the opening to the urethra, right? And so there's actually erectile tissue around that as well. Okay, so the clitoris is actually much bigger than they, than they um, draw it in textbooks. Okay. So let's look at the external genitalia of males and females. And remember that homologous means that they are the same, right? So homologous, right? And so this means that they have the same, in this case, embryonic origin. And so when we look at the um, female, and this would be the male, the female's external genitalia includes the labia majora. Okay, so these are the outer labial folds. And in the male, this same tissue embryonically becomes the scrotum, so, um, or the scrotal sacs, right? <coughs> and then we have in females, the labia minora. And this actually becomes the shaft of the penis. 
in the male. And then here we have the clitoris. And here we have the head of the penis. And interestingly, both the clitoris and the head of the penis have tissue that covers them over normally. And so these are called the prepus. Right? So they both have a prepus. And so this is just tissue that covers over the structure. And in males, oftentimes that is taken off um, during the process that is called circumcision, right? So when you have a baby boy circumcised, you just remove the prepus, okay? And unfortunately, um, there is a kind of a, a not an analogous um, situation with the females in that there is sometimes what is referred to as genital mutilation in females. Mutilation. And this is not the same thing as what we would call a female circumcision. So when I was going to school, they called this a female circumcision and they said that they've just now decided that it's not the same thing because it's not the same tissues, right? So if you were going to circumcise a female, you would just remove the head, or not the head, but you just remove the skin that covers the clitoris. But in some countries, particularly Africa, there's a, um, a, a um, kind of a cultural phenomena that involves in, in young females of the removing of the clitoris. And so they cut, cut the clitoris off, and the idea being that if the clitoris is removed and if the labia majora are sometimes sewn shut, then the female is going to be less promiscuous. And um, so this has kind of become a big deal in the United States as people have decided that they are going to seek asylum from the countries in Africa where this is currently done. And then also people bring their children to this country and then they might still want to do this cultural um, thing and then we have to make laws against it, right? So there's still um, a lot of controversy, right? And, and you know, trying to figure out how to prevent this from happening. And um, the other unfortunate thing is, is that oftentimes it's done in an unsanitary way. And so females will actually get infections and die from it. And it's actually done late. So I think it's at the age of seven is maybe the common age for it to be done. And so that's kind of a, a late time to do it. Okay. Okay, so if we look at the structures and you don't need to know these and I didn't give you the images of them, but I just thought it would be easier to see if you actually saw the structures. So notice that there is actually a line. So we actually start off, or a male would actually start off with these folds of tissue. And then as they develop, those folds of tissue fuse, and you can actually see that fusion line in the male anatomy. Okay. And then if you compare this to females, right, it's just that we, because of the presence or lack thereof of testosterone, if we lose, we don't have testosterone, then the tissues do not fuse, right? And we get the female version, okay? So this actually is due to the presence of testosterone. So the male genital development is due to the presence of testosterone. So it's kind of interesting because there are quite a few babies that are born with ambiguous genitalia. So when they come out, they kind of look like a girl and they kind of look like a boy. And in the past, they kind of made a decision right there and then whether or not you know, to do a surgery. Now they actually look at the genetics and then they, they try to figure out what, you know, what they are. Are they XX or they XY? And then they try to kind of figure out how to, um, to either give them hormonal supplements, or sometimes it requires a surgery. So sometimes babies, girls, are born with these tissues fused, right? Because they have too much testosterone in their system because of the adrenal glands. And so they have to cut them open and kind of surgically repair some of their, the incorrect fusion of the tissues. Okay, so there is a mammal 
where this happens, this, this development of the male genitalia in a female happens quite frequently. And this is what is referred to as the spotted hyena. So people were really confused, scientists were really confused when they started studying the hyenas because all the individuals in the population have a penis, including the females. So here is like a dominant female that gets two mates, right? And she has a pup and you can see that she has a, a, a structure that is very similar to a penis. And um, the babies actually have to be born out through that structure. And so it's very traumatic, the first pup that is born. And so oftentimes those will die and then it kind of stretches out. So it becomes a little bit easier with each delivery, okay? So if we look at the female um, spotted hyena, she has a penis-like structure that she gives birth out of, and she also has false scrotum. So she has a false scrotum. And the reason why they are false is that they do not contain the gonads. So the ovaries are actually still up in the body cavity. And the um, uh, kind of a false penis, where out through which the babies are born. Out through those, that's probably pups are born. Okay, so scientists ask why this is the case, right? And they believe it has to do with the type of mating system that they have. And so, um, the females are very dominant, and they have a clan, and they also have a dominant hierarchy. And the males actually are just out in the periphery of the clan, and they don't even actually get to do much. You know, they're kind of solitary. They can come in and breed with the dominant female, but then they have to leave again. And so the idea here is, is that possibly it's the dominant female that gets to breed, and all of the other females of the clan actually have to take care of, help take care of her pups. And so it's probably due to the fact that there is selection for females that are the most aggressive. So females have high levels of testosterone or even early on. And so embryonically, they develop the male structure, right? So it's probably because of the dominance hierarchy of females and the, that, the, that the female with the higher testosterone level is going to be the one that gets to reproduce. Okay. Are there any questions about that? I have lots of questions, but I don't want to come down. <laughs> so the Lion King, these are the bad guys. <laughs> but they're actually girls. I don't know. I've heard about this before. Yeah. I just, I never knew that the babies come out that. Yes. And I don't know if they've ever actually seen babies being born, because they do it, they're very secretive. They must be actually smaller than normal pups. Um, yeah, I don't know. That picture doesn't look like it's very small, but yeah, must be able to stretch yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of goes that goes directly with this idea that it's the levels of hormones that determine whether you become male or female, right? At least with the external genitalia. Okay. So when we look at the vagina, we now realize that um, we have a lot of microorganisms that colonize the vagina and actually create a good environment. And so when we look at females that are pre or post reproductive, we can specifically look at the pH. And so they tend to have a neutral or basic pH. Okay, so that would be like a young female prior to puberty or postmenopausal woman that stopped menstruating, right? So they have a neutral or a basic pH. And then if we look at reproductive females, reproductive females have an acidic pH in the vagina. which means that they um, um, have lots of hydrogen ions, right? So when we look at this, it actually has to do with the presence of symbiotic bacteria that are called lactobacilli. And so this is kind of the same, some of the same bacteria that is found in yogurt. Okay. 
right? There's actually all different kind of different strains of bacteria, but the lactobacilli feeds upon vaginal secretions. and produces lactic acid. And this does two things. This acidity destroys weak sperm. So when the sperm are ejaculated and they come into like a vagina that's a pH four, right, a lot of them die. They can't survive that acidity. And that's maybe one of the reasons why the ejaculate has to have so much sperm, right? Because a lot of them die. And then the other thing that it does is it protects against bad bacteria and fungi. Okay. So if you're a female, you know that if you go on antibiotics, especially if you're a reproductive female, you know if you go on antibiotics, you will then subsequently really be at a great risk of getting a yeast infection, right? So sometimes it used to be that like, the doctor would give you antibiotics and then he would give you a fungicide just because he knew that this was probably gonna happen. And so what happens is if when you take your antibiotic, it even kills the good bacteria in the vagina and so then you have to take a fungicide in order to kill the yeast that has then subsequently colonized your reproductive tract. Now, um, the other thing um, is, is that urinary tract infections are more common in females because their urethra is much smaller or shorter than the male. So if you think about the male's urethra, it, it kind of is away from the opening to the to the um, digestive system, but the female's urethra is really quite close, right? And so you can get bad bacteria from the anus, for example, getting into the uh, getting into the vagina and causing bad bacterial infections. And so then you get a urinary tract infection. Okay, but this good bacteria, right, is what protects most females from this. And so sometimes people argue that you can use probiotics. And I think we've talked about the importance of probiotics in terms of like the digestive system. But the probiotics um, contain um, live yeast. And so that would be like yogurt, right? And also you might have heard of acidophilus. Acidophilus has been around a long time. So what this means is this acid loving bacteria, right? And these are things that you can buy over the counter and these will help to, if you're a female and you've destroyed your good bacteria, it's always important to recolonize, right? You want the good bacteria to get back in. So after you've been on antibiotics, you wanna take, right, the probiotics in order to recolonize. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, the next thing we're gonna talk about is um, spermatogenesis or the formation of sperm, and then we're gonna compare it to oogenesis, okay? So does anybody know or remember from last quarter, if you were in last quarter, what is the type of cell reproduction that um, occurs to produce sperm? What type of cell reproduction? Meiosis, excellent, okay. So in spermatogenesis, we have a cell, right? And then it undergoes one division, and then another division, right? And then these develop into sperm. Oops, I didn't do that right. There's four of them. Uh, sorry. Okay. So I'm just drawing one sperm here, and I'm going to label it. But all of them, so for one, for one haploid cell, right, we could get... Um, for sperm developing. And the sperm is really interesting because they are actually shedding their cytoplasm. So they actually become smaller here. This is what is referred to as the head. And this contains the nucleus of the sperm. Then we have the mid piece. And it con contains mitochondria. And what do mitochondria do? Powerhouse, right? 
So they feed upon the fructose, produce ATP, right? And then we have the flagellum. Okay, so we have one diploid cell, excuse me, one diploid cell, and this produces four haploid cells. Where does this occur? Does anybody remember? Where in the male's reproductive system does spermatogenesis occur? You know this. Testes, yes. Okay. So it occurs in the testes. Okay. So they produce many small gametes, whereas the female. I'm just going to skip through this. Produces um, eggs through the process of oogenesis. So oogenesis occurs in the ovaries. Okay. And in this particular instance, one diploid cell gives rise to only one oocyte. So that's your egg cell, right, or egg. And so what, the reason why this occurs is, is that the oocytes have to be large, right? And so we get what is called unequal cytokinesis. So unequal cytokinesis means that only one nucleus gets all the cytoplasm. Okay, so if I were to draw this, I have my diploid cell in my ovary, and it's going to start to develop in a follicle in the ovary, and it's going to divide, and one nucleus is going to get no cytoplasm, and then the other nucleus is going to get all the cytoplasm. Okay. Does anybody know what this nucleus that gets no cytoplasm is called? It has a name. It is called a polar body. And the reason why it's called a polar body is, is that it kind of like sticks onto the egg. And when you watch the video, you'll see that, that this will be like, this will be the polar body and it's off to one side, right, of the big O site. And um, then when this cell divides again, one nucleus gets all of the cytoplasm and then we can get the development of a second polar body. Should make it smaller. Second polar body. Okay. So these polar bodies just are discarded, right? They're not used for anything. Okay. And so this is just a mechanism by which we get big gametes, right? If it's divided equally, then the egg cell, egg cells at the end would be one fourth of the size of the diploid cell. But in this instance, they're approximately the same size, right? So big gametes are important because early on during embryonic development, that's where the nutrients are that allows for cell division to occur prior to implantation in the uterus. Okay, so this is unequal cytokinesis. Okay, okay. so the last thing we're going to talk about today is the reproductive cycles that females go through. And this is actually your last essay question. Okay, so we have what are called the ovarian cycles. And these are regulated by hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland. And the ovarian cycles in females have to correspond directly with what is happening in the uterus because the egg, when it's ovulated and then subsequently fertilized, has to find it in the place in the uterus at a certain time when it can develop, okay? So if we look at the ovarian cycles, the first start is what is called the follicular phase. Okay, so this is where the oocyte starts to develop in a follicle.
And a follicle um, at its uh, last stage is actually kind of a fluid filled space that is surrounded by like nurse cells that help to support the oocyte. Okay, so the oocyte develops in a follicle, and this occurs in the ovary. Okay, then we have ovulation. So ovulation is where the egg is released from the ovary. And then we have the subsequent phase, which is called the luteal phase. Okay. The luteal phase is where the follicle cells, the leftover follicle cells, develop into the corpus luteum. So if we look at the hormones that are being produced in these different stages, the follicle, the developing follicle produces estrogen. So I'm going to put estrogen production right here. Okay. So that's the follicular phase, right? The luteal phase, there's two hormones involved in the luteal phase, and this is estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so that's the luteal phase, okay? So it's these different um, relative levels of the hormones that then travel via the circulatory system to the uterus, and they cause what is happening in the uterus to occur. So let's look at the uterine cycle. Okay. So when estrogen starts to pr be produced, we get what is called the proliferative phase. So proliferative means being very productive, right? And so this is where the cells that are lining the uterus reproduce. Okay, so this is the cells in the endometrium. So the endometrium is the inner layer. Reproduce. And this makes thick, thickens the wall. Okay. And this is at the same time as what is happening in the follicle. So when we have the follicular phase, we have proliferative phase, and this is due to estrogen. The next phase is called the secretory phase. And this is corresponds to the luteal. Okay, so secretory is due to estrogen and progesterone. Right? And what this means is it becomes vascular, so the endometrium becomes vascular, which means it gets lots of blood supply. So that is going to help when the embryo implants, because that blood is going to provide some nutrients to it, and glandular. So it starts to secrete um, like sugars. So it secretes glycogen, and that's the early, early embryo just feeds upon those secretions, okay? And so this would be after the egg has ovulated, right, the secretory phase would happen in the uterus, okay? Now, um, we have to ask what is going to happen if the embryo is planted versus if it doesn't implant. So we can talk about implantation. So let's talk about if the embryo does not implant. Okay, if the embryo does not implant, the corpus luteum degenerates. That's back in the ovary. 
okay? Then estrogen and progesterone levels fall. So they decrease, right? And it's the decrease of that that causes menstruation. Progesterone decrease. So menstruation occurs. And so it's when our estrogen and females, it's when your estrogen and your progesterone are lowest that that will cause the death of the, of the endometrium. And what actually happens is, is that the blood vessels constrict and it just simply starves the cells and the cells die and they slough off, okay? So that is if it does not implant, menstruation will occur. If it does, so if embryo implants, The corpus luteum is maintained. And this is the, where it gets really interesting because it's maintained by hormones produced by a viable embryo. And so the hormone that's produced by the embryo is called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. So this is human chorionic gonadotropin. Okay, and you probably have seen HCG before. One really weird way that HCG is used is in diets heard of the HCG diet and this is where people inject themselves with this hormone and it creates kind of a false like uh, pregnancy like where you get morning sickness and it makes you sick and it supposedly speeds up your metabolism and causes you to shed weight okay? so even males have been known to take that HCG diet okay this is also the chemical the hormone that is used in over-the-counter pregnancy tests and so the embryo produces it in such abundance that it is filtered out by the kidneys and it ends up in the urine. And so that's the chemical they're looking for, okay? So the really interesting thing about this is if the embryo cannot produce enough HCG, so if not enough HCG is produced, then you get what is referred to as a spontaneous abortion. And this is early, can be early, early on. So it's estimated that of the 30, of the percentage of, of embryos that were produced, about 33% of them produced an implant, about 30% of them will spontaneously abort. And so this could be like, even before, that says HCG, even before the female is, no, she's pregnant. So let's say she's a week late, or maybe even two weeks later, she's starting to get concerned, right, that she might be pregnant. Um, it, then all of a sudden she has her period. It could be that the embryo implanted, then it couldn't produce enough HCG, and then it was spontaneously aborted. So this is actually a mechanism um, by which females can kind of screen for viable embryos. If the embryo has a bad, bad genetic defect, and it implants, this is, the embryo wouldn't be viable, and so the female doesn't want to stay pregnant, and so she spontaneously aborts it. So essentially, the embryos have to prove themselves viable by producing this hormone. Okay, okay. any questions about that? So in your book, there are some diagrams. So you should take a look at them, and we'll look at them right now. Okay, so this is the follicular phase, right? The follicle is released. We call that ovulation. And then the corpus luteum forms, and then it will start to degenerate. And you'll notice here, as the follicles start to grow, we get the proliferative phase, then it becomes secretory, and if the corpus, corpus luteum degenerates, then the, the endometrium will be sloughed off. And we're, we didn't talk about FSH and LH, so the only parts that you need to be particular, pay particular attention to are the estrogen and progesterone. So notice that estrogen levels increase, right, as um, the, the um, follicle develops. 
and then the peak of estrogen causes ovulation to occur. And then in this luteal phase, which corresponds with the secretory phase, we have high levels of estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so the reason why these have to be tightly coordinated is, is you don't want to end up with an embryo in the uterus and there's no place to implant, right? The lining isn't thick enough to support it. So that was actually the answer to your last question, your last essay question. Okay, so if we look at in your book as well, okay, this is a follicle, right? It has developed. This is ovulation, right? So they've released the, the oocyte, and then we get fertilization. They're showing it right here in the fallopian tube or the oviduct, right? And then the cell starts to develop. So the embryo, the cells undergo a type of cell division called mitosis, where identical cells are produced. And then we get implantation around day eight or nine. And the embryo actually releases digestive enzymes. And it digests its way into the lining of the uterus. And then there's a little bubble. It's kind of like a little cyst forms over it. And then we get the development of the placenta. So remember, we talked about placental um, animals and placental mammals, right? And so here you can see the umbilical cord, which is fetal in origin, carries blood out to the placenta, and then the placenta actually has part maternal circulation, and then you get the kind of the, the exchange of oxygen and nutrients from the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation. And we're gonna watch a video that talks about that. And specifically, if we look at this placenta in a little bit more detail, you can see the maternal arteries